Our, our next session is entitled Anesthetics and Depression. We're delighted to have with us two experts on this topic. Uh, by way of housekeeping, since the, the speakers have very similar topics, I'm going to recommend that we hold on questions till the end, and then we'll have them both come up and ask questions. Is that okay? Our meeting organizer? Okay. Um, we'll first, first hear from uh, Dr. Irving Weiner. He comes to us from the Mitchell Woods Pharmaceuticals, where he serves as the chief scientific officer. And prior to that, he recently came, uh, was working at the Biomedical Research Center at the National Institute of Aging, one of the institutes within the NIH. He has developed an interest in metabolites of ketamine and their association with antidepressant effects. This will make an interesting topic as uh, our discussion earlier this morning on the potential benefits of anesthesia. Dr. Weiner. All right, thank you. I thank the organizers, uh, Hugo and Michael, for inviting me to come and talk to you about uh, some of our uh, work. It's also uh, was a great uh, excuse to, uh, to come back to Chicago, one of the cities that I visited a lot of times in my youth. I grew up in Detroit, and if you really wanted to have fun, you came to Chicago. Um, <laughs> except Motown was there, but that's besides the point. Um, it's also an, uh, an interesting place because one of the aspects of, of where I want to concentrate on this talk, which actually is a reflective uh, of what uh, the last couple sessions have talked about, was a, was a book actually written by a guy named Thomas Kuhn, who you may or may not be familiar with. It, it was at the University of Chicago. And he wrote uh, a number of books on philosophy and, and history of science. And the one in particular that uh, I'm going to frame this discussion on, uh, and really our previous discussions have addressed, is a book called The Foundations of Scientific Revolution. And in this book, uh, this Dr. Kuhn talks about paradigms. And he talks about how people put together paradigms to explain scientific and medical phenomena. And these paradigms then get almost into laws or into operating theories. And their students that come up get trained into these paradigms. So they begin to do what Dr. Kuhn calls normal science. In other words, they're working within an already set framework. But then problems happen. And when these problems happen, the paradigms have to get rocked. And it's usually the younger people or people that are ignorant of the paradigms, such as myself, um, who eventually drill enough holes in those paradigms that they have to fall. So the paradigm that we're going to talk about and where we're going is ketamine. And as you all know, ketamine is a chiral fencyclidine derivative introduced in the 1960s, developed at Park Davis as an intravenous uh, anesthetic agent, and a reasonably good one as well. Now, one of the first things that people understood when they look at the drug in some of the first uh, experiments is that ketamine is rapidly and extensively metabolized. And uh, we're going to talk today about ketamine, and that's the ketamine. It's endomethylated metabolite, which is norketamine. Uh, we will briefly mention, but not really concentrate on dehydral norketamine. But the other ones that we're going to talk about are down here in the corner. And this one is called hydroxynorketamine, and it's normally understood to go from ketamine to norketamine, and then it's hydroxylated to hydroxynorketamine. And the last one that we'll touch at the end is another hydroxynorketamine. Now the difference, these are compounds which have two chiral centers. This one is a uh, one that is a 2S6S, 2R6R, 
and that's the one that we'll mostly talk about. It's labeled 4A, and you can't see it. And so when I talk, in, unless I tell you differently, I'm really talking about this metabolite right here. The other metabolite is the diastereomer, which is the actually the 2S6R, or the 6R2S. And we'll talk about this again, it, that it does not come through this pathway, but it goes through this pathway. What's the importance of it, we'll, we'll talk about later. Now, the defining experiment in ketamine for everybody in this room, and the one that has been referred to indirectly in just about every ketamine article I have ever read, was done by Leung and Bailey in 1986. Now this is an excellent example of medicinal chemistry, of pharmacology, and it really clearly understands and shows how ketamine works, except the experiment was set up for anesthetic effects. So what Leung and Bailey showed, and how they set the experiment up, is that they made the three metabolites, or ketamine, it's norketamine, and this is this 4A, again, this hydroxy norketamine. And they went ahead and injected it into rats, and they looked for anesthetic effects and for post-anesthetic effects. So what did they find? Well, the first thing that they found was exactly what you had seen in liver microsomes, whether it be rat, mouse, human, rabbit, etc is that, in fact, ketamine is converted to norketamine and hydroxynorketamine. So if you inject ketamine, which is here, let's look at the plasma, if you inject ketamine, you wind up with norketamine and hydroxynorketamine. If you inject norketamine, you wind up with hydroxynorketamine, and if you start out with hydroxynorketamine, you get just hydroxynorketamine. So the metabola metabolism that pattern is, is set. Now the other thing that you see here is that this is 10 minutes. So the fact that this is rapid, in two minutes, you're starting to look at significant amounts of these metabolites. So ketamine is extensively metabolized and it's rapidly metabolized. Now here's the other thing that they found, that these compounds cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, if you're a medicinal chemist and you look at the structures, you say, hmm, they're not very hydrophobic. You really wouldn't expect to see them all in the brain, but in fact, they do, and they pretty readily pass the blood-brain barrier, as you can see right here, in the same order. You give ketamine, and in the brain, in 10 minutes, you've got a lot of norketamine and hydroxynorketamine, norketamine, hydroxynorketamine, and just hydroxynorketamine. But now, this is the key finding that when they looked at the pharmacodynamics of it, what they found is that the CNS activities associated with general anesthesia and recovery were produced by RS ketamine and RS norketamine, while this hydroxynorketamine, the 4A, was inactive. This is in anesthesiology, right? This is the anesthetic effect. If you start to look at papers on depression or pain, you will see ketamine and norketamine and every aspect of hydroxynorketamine not being mes me me mentioned, excuse me, and there's actually even a paper in anesthesiology that was dismissing some of our earlier work by saying the inactive metabolite, hydroxynorketamine. Well, yeah anesthesiology, I would not give, put, try to put somebody to sleep, and we tried this with mice with hydroxynorketamine. So where do we stand? Well, there was a development after this work, and in ketamine, what I call the ketamine paradigm. It is basically, again, the major metabolite of ketamine is norketamine. The therapeutic activity is due to ketamine and norketamine, and RS ketamine and norketamine are NMDA inhibitors, which they are, uh, and this is the basis for their pharmacological effects. And again, if any of you have, have read these papers, they'll always start, we've been in the study of ketamine, 
an NMDA receptor antagonist, comma, and its major metabolite, norketamine, comma, and NMDA receptor antagonist, comma, were studied in depression. So it, it's, it's the paradigm. If you want to know what ketamine does in pain and depression, you go back to anesthesia. Well, maybe not. So as you know, or people know, that the sub-anesthetic uh, sub doses of RS ketamine, talking fast, trying to stay, <laughs> stay on course, I'll slow down. The sub-anesthetic dose of RS ketamine, um, given as a 40-minute infusion, again, 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, produces rapid and sustained antidepressant effects in patients suffering from treatment-resistant major depressive disorder and bipolar depression. When we tried to do the PKPD modeling of this, and I got these samples from Carlo Zarate uh, at the National Institutes of Mental Health, and we sat down and looked at it, what we found is the ketamine paradigm does not work for sub dosing of RS ketamine. It has not been possible to establish pharmacodynamic relationships for the antidepressant effects produced by sub-anesthetic dosing. Now, there are some papers out there that do do this, but the assumption that you have to make is that at one part of the aspect, norketamine gives a positive effect, and later on it gives a negative effect, and frankly, I know I didn't do very well in, in calculus and the rest, and by the third page of this uh, paper, I had to figure what we had to really do is a little philosophical aspects, get out Akin's razor and just cut out all this crap and see what really was happening. And what I was drawn to is something that I read in my youth, and it's uh, something that was essentially said a little bit earlier, that it's a mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to fit theories instead of theories to fit facts. And it was essentially some of the things that we just recently talked about. Where is the basis for data? So with this as an understanding, we went and looked at some of the data. So we took Carlos's data, and the first thing you have to ask yourself is, is this true? Are there metabolites? Are there a lot of metabolites? And this is essentially just the, the uh, serum uh, levels of ketamine norketamine, dehydronorketamine, this 4A that we're talking about, hydroxynorketamine, and that 4B, which is the, its diastereomer. Um, essentially, as you can see, and these are in 40 minutes, 80 minutes, 110 minutes, so a lot of this compound, ketamine is rapidly cleared, norketamine is cleared, uh, and this compound is sitting around for a long time, as is the hydroxynorketamine. So we have, at least in the initial aspect, that they're there. These metabolites are there after a single 40-minute infusion of a sub-anesthetic dose of ketamine. Now, is there any correlation? 